and the final part of the approach is that we're going to start treatment for um, hepatic encephalopathy and you know, the the two agents we most commonly use are lactulose and rifaximin. So, Dave, maybe you can tell us a little bit about those two medications. Uh, what's their mechanism of action? How are they going to help a patient with hepatic encephalopathy? Sure. So, uh, lactulose, like you had mentioned, is kind of our current standard of care, and it's it's really been being used for a period of decades, um, um, even before a lot of uh, some of the randomized trials have kind of come out for this. So. Lactulose is a non-absorbable disaccharide that is broken down in the colon. So there's kind of a couple of different mechanisms or proposed mechanisms by which it can um, reverse or it can treat episodes of hepatic encephalopathy. So the first being that as it's broken down in the colon, it's broken down into acetic acid as well as lactic acid. So the point here being that the acidification of the colon is then going to prevent ammonia from being absorbed into the portal system, and instead, we're going to have a conversion to ammonium. Lactulose also causes an osmotic cathartic effect, so increasing the gut transit time is something that also will prevent the absorption of ammonia. There's also some well or less described mechanisms by which lactulose can be um, potentially a prebiotic effect in such that the, the non-absorbable disaccharide component of it may preferentially select certain gut microbiome, but there's kind of for and against data that's sort of supporting those things and even some things that are kind of on the horizon for that. Lactulose is a medication that when first initiating therapy for a patient, we usually use somewhere between 20 and 30 grams every two to four hours trying to induce bowel movements in the patients. Um, as we had mentioned previously, a lot, um, one of the precipitating factors for encephalopathy is constipation. So ensuring that patients are having one to two bowel movements per day, and even in some cases, even more, in order to reverse these severe episodes of hepatic encephalopathy are very important. Uh, now, lactulose is, uh, it does come with some side effects as well. Um, particularly, we mentioned another precipitating factor is by giving too much lactulose and inducing too many bowel movements, this may ultimately dehydrate the patient. It can cause hypovolemia, um, hypovolemia which would then, of course, precipitate another event of, of hepatic encephalopathy. Additionally, a lot of the patients um, don't love the fact that they need to be having two, three bowel movements per day. and um, Perianal um, irritation is something that's very common for these patients that um, they'll bring up that they, they really don't like taking lactulose. And additionally, it kind of has a little bit of a funky taste and a lot of patients, even when they come to me after a liver transplant, will say, hey, I'm so glad that now I can finally stop taking the lactulose. Um, rifaximin, kind of on the other hand, is um, also a non-absorbable um, compound. However, in this case, it's actually an antibiotic. So it's part of the rifamycin class of antibiotics that is preventing the, the, or is inhibiting the bacteria in the colon, which then produce ammonia, and that gets absorbed into the portal system. If I could just jump in and, and say one thing, I, and I really like that explanation of the multiple mechanisms uh, of lactulose, and I, I, but to reframe it in the context of the patient who's showing up in our emergency room, I like to t talk to the house staff about two different approaches to the use of lactulose. And first is you need an induction dose, and then there's the maintenance dose. And the maintenance dose is the number of bowel movements that patient needs to be uh, of, of their normal baseline cognition. But in order to induce remission of that overt episode, you may need to give them a lot of lactulose first. So in that context, the order titrate to three bowel movements daily is grossly inadequate for the patient who's showing up with inability to protect their airway. Absolutely. You need to administer. You know, a lot of patients and their families want to know what to do at home when a bout of HE is in its earliest stages because they identify it. Once patients have this once or twice, they and their family members often know what's happening before it happens or when it's starting, and they will contact the nurse, and the first thing the nurse tells them at home is give extra lactulose. Take a, take a cup and take it right now. And if you're starting to get better in an hour or two, take another cup, even before the patient comes into the hospital. So that's absolutely the approach. 
It's not necessarily based on bowel movements in the acute setting. And once you start to turn a patient around, that's when you start to be thinking about the maintenance dose, which of course is based on uh, number of bowel movements daily. Dave, you mentioned some potentially adverse uh, reactions to lactulose, mainly the, the taste and the diarrhea and, and irritation around the anus if you're having that many bowel movements. Um, rifaximin, are there any safety concerns with that, that medication? Rifaximin doesn't have too many safety concerns associated with it, particularly because it, it doesn't get absorbed into the systemic circulation. Um, so more often than not, um, there's not tremendous, you know, when I'm counseling a patient about taking rifaximin, I don't particularly go over a lot of side effects that they might experience. There are some things that are published case reports of, of re resistant type infections such as C. difficile, but again, those are sort of on the case report level. And even if you're, if you're interested, you can, there's in vitro data to say that rifaximin may even have some activity against C. diff. Um, not to say that it's necessarily a treatment for it, but um, so the side effect profile of rifaximin is quite minimal.